So Dr. Nathan Tai, he is an assistant professor at the University of Nebraska Kearney in the Department of History. He actually is a Kearney native, um, but he got his bachelor's degree from Creighton, and then he went on to get his um, doctorate at University of Illinois, I believe. Okay, um, and so I've known Dr. Tai for a lot of years. He has a, a really great interest in, um, of course, this area being a Central Nebraska native himself. He has a fascination with the Abbots. We were just talking about the Abbots, and he's done some research on the Abbots as well. And then also, if you um, listened this week, The Independent, we actually recorded a podcast series last summer that's just now being released. And um, this week, this past with, uh, Tuesday, was the first episode that was released, and it was um, Jim Dean, who's on our board, was talking about the Peak Murders. There's actually six episodes in that whole series. Um, I'll do a couple of them, and Dr. Ty is gonna do one about Nebraska's first serial killer. So I wrote about it a few years ago, and I'm excited to hear what he has to say on the podcast. But for today, he is gonna be talking to his, us about his research project. And um, I'm gonna read this so I don't, don't uh, miss anything, but he researches the fascinating but misunderstood lives of hobos, tramps, and other transient workers that travel across the, Midwest, uh, across the West and the Midwest by hopping trains from the 1870s to the 1930s. And of course, you know, Grand Island being here in um, central Nebraska, and we actually had three railroads coming to Grand Island, of course. We had the Burlington, which we still have today, we're in the beautiful Burlington Station, the Union Pacific, and then we had the St. Joe Railroad. So we have a lot of transient workers coming through Grand Island during that time. So I will turn it over to Dr. Tai. Well, as always, thank you, Michelle. Um, thank you to Hall County Historical Society for inviting me today. Um, we're gonna talk about something that you all certainly know about in a probably, you know, someone with a red handkerchief and a bindle. Um, a dirty face, maybe hopping out of a boxcar, but there's a lot more to it than that. And so we're going to dive into um, the history of hobos in Nebraska. And I want to start off with, with one typical hobo journey um, across the state. Let's get over a little bit so you can see. Um, on September 14, 1897, a lean, tanned hobo from, from Illinois stepped out of a boxcar in McCook and he was looking for a meal. And this hobo, just 19 years old, uh, born to Swedish immigrant parents, was named Gus. Scrawny, kind of, uh, you know, tiny little kid. And he was trying to get his bearings in the McCook rail yard. And, and as he's hopping out of the boxcar, though, he, he notices that there's a one-eyed man in plain clothes with a club and a star. The railroad officer, known to help both his bulls, made it clear that, that his type, that Gus, was not welcomed in the town. So Gus, Gus climbed aboard his boxcar and headed towards Lincoln on the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy. After a few days filling up on pilfered corn on a hobo jungle outside Aurora, Gus traveled to Nebraska City where he chopped lumber, picked apples, and slept in the city jail. Then, quote, I caught a freight for Omaha. For years I've been curious about Omaha and all of its interesting city names. Is any more musical than Omaha? Aww. There he found Nebraska's hobo capital, a skid row warehouse district bordering the Union Pacific Railroad filled with flop houses, bars, and cheap restaurants. And, and Gus, and, and, and we'll see what happens to Gus later, but, but Gus typified hobo workers in Nebraska. He left home looking for, week, for work, he worked for two weeks as a section hand in Missouri, another two weeks washing dishes in Kansas City, harvesting hay and broom corn in Lindsburg, Kansas, where despite his own Swedish heritage and fluency, the Swedish farmhands he toiled besides considered him a bum. Did not consider him a fellow Swede. A quick study, Gus adapted to the peripheral life of a transient worker on the Great Plains, and he discovered in McCook and Kansas the negativity that it carried. He was later, as he recalled, quote, a young stranger meeting many odd strangers. These odd strangers, and this is uh, kind of a typical group, it's actually labeled typical young hobos here, um, these odd strangers were, were, were floating laborers, known derisively as, as hobos, tramps, bums, and, and we'll see other names, who hopped trains and, and found work across Nebraska from the end of the Civil War through the Second World War. Uh, 
The history of the men and women who worked the harvests, dug ditches, laid rail, hopped trains across the state is both a troubling history of exploitation and dehumanization and a story of perseverance and survival. Hobo workers were very poorly paid, subject to difficult working conditions, and abused by railroads and local law enforcement. Now, before we dig into this history today, this is, this is a map from the 1940s that gives you a sense of the circuits that agricultural workers are moving across in the United States in the early 20th century. And as we dig into this, we need to, to kind of understand who exactly these, these people are. And so, beginning in the late 19th century, you see a lot of folks, because of increased agricultural production, the, the proliferation of the railroads, and the need for, for harvest labor. So labor for a very short period of time when crops are ripe, um, that cannot be met by local demand. Men and some women are following these different paths for seasonal agricultural labor. And when they're not in the harvest, they're then going to be moving into uh, what are then known as Skid Row districts, as hobo capitals. Like in many cities across the United States, big and small, have these uh, areas where hobos will then winter over when they're not. And we're going to follow them as, as we kind of go through this landscape. Now, as we kind of understand, you know, agricultural labor in Nebraska, this is a typical photo. This is um, actually a family in, in Dawson County. This is my family. Um, at the turn of the century, my great-grandfather is the, the little boy on the far left. Um, these are our German-speaking immigrant um, farmers, and, and they have quite impressively uh, all gone in on an upright steam thresher. Uh, which we still actually have the mortgage papers for. Um, very expensive piece of machinery. But this typified agricultural labor in, in large parts of the state. You needed a substantial workforce. And this is before widespread mechanization, okay? To, to harvest your wheat, to shock your wheat, um, even to, to husk your corn, okay? And in this case, everyone in this photo is related. It's a very large family. Um, it's all brothers and cousins. But, but most families don't have that, and most communities can't provide the labor. Um, so you have scenes like this which typify, which are not family members, presumably. That in many communities, again, because of the, the demands for harvest labor and other types of casual labor, building rail lines, digging ditches, building buildings and things, you needed men who were semi-skilled, could show up, get the job done, and then leave. And that they would do it for, for very little money. And we know these men as, uh, from a, a wide range of names, okay? So, hobos, bums, and tramps are the common types, but these are all the other names that these folks would be referred to as, okay? And sometimes it just depended on the, the time in the day about whether you would be a hobo or not, whether you had money in your pocket, whether you had a shave, whether you could be arrested under a vagrancy statute, okay? It also depended, as in many of these terms, on the type of labor that they did. Okay. A hobo is, is just a, uh, someone who works or, or wanders to work. A tramp is someone who works to wander, and a bum does neither. <laughs> but from that wider kind of uh, trinity, there's, there's a number of different names in, in, in a number of different languages, and I, I want to point out, you know, a couple of these, most notably Cornhusker, <laughs> um, that makes studying these folks infuriatingly difficult. Again, because you could be a hobo in the morning, and you could be um, a lumberjack in the afternoon, you could be a hired hand for a couple of weeks, and then when your job's done, you're back to being a train. So in the eyes of the law, the, the terms for these people um, you know, really varied. And the standard way to travel, okay, the defining characteristic of a transient worker, yes, this is an incredibly dangerous way to ride, okay? Because if you think about railroad technology, in this time period. It's steam locomotives, so they require a lot of water, a lot of coal. They're not going as fast, and they're stopping more often. Okay? You also have a lot more facilities, a lot more um, different places that the railroad, the train is going to stop. So it's much easier to crawl into one of these types of cars. And this is what's called riding the rods. These are, these are the earlier form of box cars where you have the steel rods underneath and you crawl under. Sometimes, if you're a smart hobo, if, you, if you've been at it for a little while, you have a little piece of wood you can put under your back or put on your stomach to give you a little bit of platform. But they also write about tying themselves to these things, holding on for dear life. Um, unfortunately, many times, 
documentation that the cobalts are in the communities, our, our bodies and angled bodies are found by railroad tracks, or just limbs in some cases. But this is how hobos are traveling. Okay? You're, you're, you're being paid very, very poorly. You don't have enough money for a regular ticket. And you're needed in the next town down the line. You've, you've, you've heard that a farmer's hiring, or that there's, there's a new irrigation project and they need something to work on it, or what have you. And so hobos will typically travel. They will also travel um, later on inside boxcars, typically breaking and breaking seals on boxcars and traveling inside, or also traveling in the unfilled ice bunkers of reefer cars, um, but that often being discovered frozen when yeah, ice is filled in. And when they're not working, they're often in the hobo jungle. Most communities on a railroad had a hobo jungle that was known both to members of the community, it was an open secret. The hobos knew where it was at. It was usually by the water tower or, or on the proximity of the rail yard, some place that the trains were going to be you know, slowing down or, or speeding up just where you can hop on and off. Okay? Um, it was also a place where everybody in town knew the hobos were at because they needed some work done. If you needed some, you know, timber cut in your house, some lumber, you had a project, you needed a day laborer, you could go down to the hobo temple. Rail crews, depending, again, depending on their relationship with the hobo, there's a number of oral histories with train crews during the Great Depression going down before their shifts and getting coffee in the hobo jungles, because hobo coffee was way better, because it was, it was like molasses. <laughs> um, but this, is, this typifies you know, these types of, of arrangements. Now, hobos appear on the scene in the aftermath of the Civil War. Now think about that. You have a, untold numbers of men who are suddenly unemployed, who had fought on either side of the conflict. Okay? And you have also the, the conclusion of the trans, first trans railroad line and rapid expansion across what becomes the Midwest and the American West. You need people to build towns. You need people to build railroads. You need people working on these farms. And so many of these men who are unemployed after the war, it's also a lot of individuals who fought for the Confederacy who don't want to come home. Um, so much so that this is from Frank Lindsay's Illustrated Newspaper in 1878, depicting hobos along the Union Pacific. And that they are so thick and so common that anybody riding a train can just look out and see a passing train and see it covered in hobos, as we see um, in, up here in the uh, upper right hand there. There they're riding underneath the train car or, or getting beat off on the top. And they're so common. Um, in the state of Nebraska by this time period. Now, how many of you have, have read your fair share of work together? Oh, I'm very disappointed. Um, who's read Mind's Man? Okay. Go on, we need Mind's Man. Um, you're not that far away from my club. You should, you should um, know your will of Cather. But in Mind's Man, there's, a, there's a, a, a very brutal scene indicating the presence of, of hobos in the state of Nebraska, where a hobo shows up when Antonia and her family are threshing in their field outside Red Cloud. Well, what is Red Cloud? And the hobo, tired of tramping, jumps into the thresher. <laughs> and kills himself. And Antonia has a full view of that scene. But showing you the brutality of this life, and that they're, the, how common this is. Catherine also writes in Song of the Lark, um, which is also which is set in Moonstone, Colorado, which which is with everything Cather, it's Red Cloud, um, about a tramp who is rejected um, by local members of the community and chased out. So he crawls into the city water tower and drowns. And dozens of people in in town die of typhoid. Um, and then they they look into the water tower and they find the tramp floating. And this is based on the real anecdote in Red Cloud that they found a. a set of clothing at the foot of the water tower and thought somebody had got in. And so this regional demand for, for casual labor very quickly integrated hobo workers into the Nebraska economy. So much so that it's appearing in literature, it's appearing in, in, in popular periodicals. Um, and newspapers are, are documenting this presence and, and both the, the, the need for hobos and the disdain for hobos. So 
all along the rail line. And there's a lot of um, newspaper correspondence that, that documents, particularly in the central part of the state, between North Platte, Kearney, and Grand Island, um, particularly along the Pacific of station masters communicating as trains are going through the yard, the, the hobos are going to, to one community or the other. Um, and it's, you know, this, this is showing us over the 1890s, 19 aughts, and then into um, the World War I era, that it's almost as if a annual plague, you can set your watch to it, that as the corn starts to ripen, as the wheat starts to get ready, they're going to show up. Now, these people are, are hobos are, are heavily maligned. Okay. They're, they're abused, they're policed with vagrancy laws, which says if you don't have, um, you know, if you, if you have the wrong appearance, if you don't have enough money in your, your wallet, we can imprison you. Uh, we, can, we can ask you, take you to the county line, and tell you to move on. And we're going to see various episodes of this in the history of Nebraska. Um, and so by 1893, when the United States sinks into its first Great Depression, okay, this, is, this was the Great Depression before the Great Depression. Hobos were everywhere. Unemployment is, is upwards of, of 12% across the United States. Particularly in the winter of 1893 um, and into 1894, there are, are tens of thousands of people on the streets in most major metropolitan cities. And the population of hobos spikes all over the United States. Uh, people just out and about looking for work. In, in many senses, what's going to presage the Great Depression. And we see this, this is, this is a, a satirical cartoon from Puck, which is a, a magazine published in New York City, and it's showing all the wealthy elites um, dealing with the reality of the depression, that you're going to have to sell, seen here in the middle, you're going to have to sell you know, your fancy gowns to um, working class and middle class women, um, that you're going to have to get the worst box at the opera, okay? or you're going to have to have your cocktails out of, well, you're going to get served out of a big pot, or up in the corner you're going to have to start traveling like hobo. Now, the unemployed during the um, Depression of 1893 didn't take it sitting down that they were being maligned, mistreated, and abused by um, large swaths of the American public. So much so that in the spring of 1894, an Ohio, a populist-minded Ohio businessman by the name of Jacob Coxey um, creates what's known as the Common Wheel Movement that he wants to have a march on Washington, D.C. to deliver a petition to call for federal employment of the unemployed to improve the infrastructure of the United States. We have untold number of people who are out of work. We need to improve our roads. It would be a benefit to farmers and others if we have better roads. You can get to market. You can sell your goods. Why don't we put these men to work? Pay them with, with federal monies. Now, this idea, very radical at, at this time period, um, he decides that he's going to mount this action by, by marching on Washington. This is the first march on Washington, D.C. Because of the ways in which protest is enacted in this time period, this is seen as incredibly radical. You would go to Washington, D.C. and make your voices heard. Okay. And so he creates industrial armies and others who adhere to um, this position many of whom are, who are hobo workers, form their own industrial armies all bound for Washington, D.C. So, um, to give you a sense, the actual Coxey's army is only coming from Massillian, Isle, or Ohio, where Coxey's from, to Washington, D.C., but there are armies that steal trains and travel all the way from the west coast of the United States. Okay, so you can imagine the terror in many people's eyes in the 1890s when you have roving bands of hobo armies, stealing trains, crossing the Sierra Nevadas, and coming through your town. Okay. Now, when I say coming through your town, I quite literally mean coming through your town. Um, that the Grand Island Independent writes when Kelly's army, which is the San Francisco contingent of um, Coxey's army, comes through, that, um, you know, that it is, um, in front of place. Yeah, there are enthusiastic crowds that welcome them. Um, they cross Nebraska on the Union Pacific, and in an independent interview with, with uh, General Kelly, who was leading the army, 
He says, what we will do when we get to Washington, petitions after petitions have been sent to the president and Congress praying for legislation on behalf of the laboring men, but they have never been recognized. Our men are not armed, they are peaceable and law-abiding, and we shall march right up to the White House steps, and we believe we will be recognized. And they came aboard a stolen Union Pacific train um, that they had, they had acquired um, in the West and, and crossed the deserts and the mountains before passing through Grand Island in April of 1894. And among them was a young 18-year-old boy from Oakland by the name of Jack London. And in his diary, he records in Grand Island the enthusiastic crowds on foot and horses and double gigs turning out along the way. And this is actually the page from Jack London's diary when he passes through Grand Island. Okay, so here's actually says Grand Island on um, April 18, um, 1894. He's, he's very, very happy he stops because the communities are also actually very supportive of what the army is articulating. That these um, mobilized hobos, many of whom were unemployed and, and were deemed hobos, although Jacob Coxey tried to make very clear that we're not an army of hobos. We just look and act and, and in most cases, smell like hobos. Um, Jack London's very, very excited when he comes through because he gets, he gets a nice meal and he gets, he gets some white bread and some ham um, when the army passes through Grand Island. And his is also the oldest known hobo diary. Hobos are notoriously bad record keepers. Understandable if you're in a boxcar, you're under a boxcar, you're on top of a boxcar, you really can't take good notes. Um, so the fact that his survived is, is, is just kind of an incredible, um, you know, part of the vagaries of history. And then he would later transform it into a, a, a underappreciated novel called The Road, which didn't sell that well, so they pulped most of them. Um, but when he stops in Grand Island, he was given a fine dinner, although he writes they were guarded by the local police. <laughs> Grand Islanders turned out and provided a meal of boneless ham, cheese, bologna, bread, and crackers to the men. Um, and when the army passed through Nebraska, folks were generally supportive. As I said, two days before London recorded his Grand Island dinner, the Independent offered a generous assessment of the army. Quote, they were a dust begrimed and dirty looking set of men. Sort of title for the document, sorry. But also, who wouldn't be in that condition after traveling three days in a boxcar and two along the railroads? Neighboring communities offered similar conclusions. The Kearney Hub argued that the marchers, quote, were passing were not tramps nor vagrants, but law-abiding citizens with nothing to do, seeking only the remedy that suggests itself, and as such are entitled to the sympathy of the public and the helping hand of every man and woman professing the creed of humanity. When they passed through Grand Island, it was estimated 1,200 to 1,500 people. So you can imagine a, a, a stolen train with a thousand and some change um, passing through the community, and, and Grand Island residents turned out to see them. Um, the Independent also tells us that a large number of citizens went to the stockyards to see the men and the passenger depot, the Union Pacific Depot, I'm sorry, unfortunately, it would be wonderful if it was this building, was crowded with people who wanted to get a glimpse of the army. Ultimately, the Independent concluded, quote, that the mayor and council conducted them through Grand Island right smartly, but, the cap but the, at the capital, the word halt will be in order and not move on. Now, the movement of Kelly's army across the United States, ultimately they do make it to Washington, D.C. Okay, this is, this is an image of uh, Jacob Coxey on top of his um, carriage. They, they march into the city, they've got banners. Their, uh, Nellie Bly, the famous female reporter, is among the throngs taking them into the city. They get to the U.S. Capitol building where they're gonna present their petition from these thousands of unemployed men, and Jacob Coxey is arrested for stepping on the ground. They don't actually get the petition to the Capitol, um, and then the movement falls apart. The army kind of camps out on the border of uh, Washington, D.C. For, for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, um, and then it just dissipates. But this is, this is the first march on the Capitol. This is, what we then see in the Civil Rights Movement and, and later actions of you know, people bringing their petitions directly to the government um, that, is, that is carried on the backs of these unemployed transient workers. Um, now, the Depression continued. Um, there was no federal effort to alleviate any of the problems. The ways in which communities and states ultimately responded to unemployment is with revised vagrancy statutes. 
statutes. That in the 1890s, in Nebraska, and in 1896, the state legislatures passed very harsh laws directly targeting trans. That if you don't have a certain amount of money in your wallet, if you look a um, certain way, they were, in many cases, they were known as unsightly beggar ordinances. That if you have visible scarring, if you're dirty, um, if you're hanging out in a place that you shouldn't be, really you could get arrested for anything with vacancy. Um, and so, oh, that is not the. So this is this is a mugshot for for a vagrant arrested during this time period. Um, and in communities in Nebraska, what they would do when you were charged with vagrancy is you would have to do hard labor, as you've probably seen in many a Looney Tune cartoon, um, breaking rocks into smaller rocks. Uh, was often what they were doing. This is what they would do in carting. This is what they would do in the cook. Um, and then they would use the stone to grade the roads. Or for the railroads. In uh, other communities, they would clean the courthouse lawn. Or they would scrub and clean the streets. And in North Platte, they would, they would clean the gutters, clean dead animals off the road, and clean horse manure. Um, and if they refused to do this, which in many cases the hobos did, they would be put in solitary confinement and fed on uh, bread and water. <laughs> And so the conditions for the treatment of unemployed in the 1890s for hobos is brutal. Okay, this is not a lifestyle that folks welcome. This is a matter of survival, that you're engaged in casual labor, that you're riding under trains, and that you're trying to survive at the margins of society. And the only place that you can really find any sort of community, and for most hobos, are in Skid Row neighborhoods. So hobos would work during the agricultural season in, in whatever industry or, or kind of combination of industries that they're working in. Um, and then as the temperatures get lower, they would typically recede to Skid Row neighborhoods. And the term Skid Row comes from the neighborhood in Seattle, the Skid Row, where they would actually move timber down. They had big wooden um, skids. They would, they would line the street with, with timber, and then they would bring logs and things down. And that's where the lumberjacks and the hobos who were working in the industry would live. Okay. And so most communities, this is Jobbers Canyon in Omaha, which is now uh, the Gene Lakey Park and Conagra headquarters. It's the, it's the largest natural historic district destroyed in US history when Conagra decided to build their headquarters. They destroyed most of this neighborhood. And then the, the, the partial remnant of this is also the old market. And it was filled with large warehouses, um, flop houses, and other types, you know, uh, used clothing, um, businesses, church missions, religious missions, soup kitchens, um, places where you could get a cup of coffee and a piece of bread for a nickel, and then flop houses where you could sleep for a nickel a night. And this is where the hobos would spend their winters, okay, before moving back out. And most Skid Row neighborhoods were also built in close proximity to the railroads, okay, so that you can, you can move fairly quickly. And so there are places where hobos could go. And there's a number of photos we're going to talk about more of these, but these are all taken during the Great Depression by a photo by the name of the photographer by the name of John Bashan in Jobbers Canyon. And so giving you a sense, you know, of a room for 20 cents and a bed for 15. And so you're going to have an entire floor of one of these block houses, just row after row after row of bed, okay, with, with mattresses filled with straw, almost certainly got fleas in them or something. Okay, and 15 cents a night. So you spend your day at the bar, you spend your day at the mission, you spend your day in, in Omaha at what was known as Jackson Square Park, which is now underneath the interstate, and then go out once the weather gets open. And Omaha had a smaller Skid Row district, it's now the Haymarket, which is now um, where the athletic compound is, the uh, athletic facilities are, and and restaurants and things, but the train depot is, is still down there in the heart, heart of the Haymarket. And this is, you know, one of those lovely things that, that as a historian you just love to find, is, is on a cold day in 1914, a group of hobos went into the train depot that is, that is still there in Lincoln and got chased out by the sheriff. And they sang a song, which someone, unclear who, recorded for us. Um, is they're being marched down to the jail, Lincoln Jail. There's a spot on K Street, we know it full well, a Lyman Stone building, Sheriff Hires Hotel. 
and that's the, the limestone city buildings that's still there off, just off O Street. Of beans in South Valley, they feed you enough, but the dish water coffee, I gag on the stuff. Oh <laughs> sheriff, oh sheriff, I don't like the smell nor the bedbugs of life, lice in your limestone hotel. <laughs> the men who gave us, the, the, the man, and this was collected by a, a folklorist by the name of Edwin Ford Piper, who taught at the University of Iowa for, for many, many years, um, and was a classmate of Willow Cather's at um, UNL. The man who gave me this, said it was sung in the patrol wagon by a crowd of bums who were removed from the Burlington Depot where they had gone to keep warm in the, um, and then to the jail date about 1914. And so this also gives you a sense in the middle of the winter that they're looking for the only warm place that they can find. And the treatment that they get, maligned, abused, um, and again, the vagaries of uh, how the archives work that this has survived. Now, not everybody hopping a freight during this time period would necessarily be considered a hobo, but they would be pretending like they were a hobo. I'm, I'm very aware of what today is, so um, I do have to, I did have to include this. Um, so in the teens and the 20s, it's, it's, you all know uh, Nebraskans like our football, and we like the Huskers. And we also know that college students are not always the smartest. So in the teens and the 20s, the tradition was for the big out-of-town game, usually against wherever rivalry, either Iowa or Kansas, students would hop trains illegally <laughs> and hobo their way to the games. Yeah, but in 1924, the athletic department, after a decade of this, finally said, no, please don't do this. Stop doing this. And they did, they did ultimately stop. But this is, this is from 1913. Uh, this is an account from the Daily Nebraskan, where uh, the title of the, the article is, As Many Travel to KU on Pure Nerve Tickets. <laughs> and the team is welcomed at the train depot in Lawrence by 40 students covered in grime and cinders <laughs> and just looking <laughs> awful. Okay, but they beat them, they beat, they beat the team down there. Um, and the article talks about the annual ex exodus spoken of each year about the time of the big out-of-town out of game is set in. And Nebraska will be represented by far more than the numbers checked in by the conductors. <laughs> Bumming is a game in which the individual takes the offensive, the railroad company def the defensive, and conductors acting as referees and field judges get the blame for every failure that flows. So when you think about the dedication that we have in this football team, through thick and thin, um, it is not to this level. I would hope that students are not doing this today. Um, also, the Big Ten is a little bigger than uh, the old divisions. Um, but it gives you a sense, too, about how common illicit train travel was. There was something a lot of young kids did. Um, that, you know, you think about the safety and the training that kids get, the, the live, listen, live today, that is not part of the conversation in this time period. And so a lot of young kids are also, there's a lot of documentary evidence, uh, young kids in central Nebraska hopping trains in many of the surrounding communities around here. We don't have very a very robust road system in, in depending on the time period, um, you know, and students may or may not know, or young people may or may not know who's actually running the trains, because most of the train crews are local. Um, and you also, depending on the railroad, can pay for a ticket on a freight train. Um, and usually like sit in the caboose, again, for, for kind of local train travel in this time period. But, you know, after, as we're starting to get into the World War I period, nobody has really been advocating for transient workers like Jacob Coxie had. That we need to give you employment, we need to give you resources, and we need to make those demands. Until the emergence of the industrial workers for the world. Which is the first and only union for hobo workers in the United States. Now, the industrial workers of the world were founded in Chicago in 1905. They're an anarchist union. Uh, many, many of the founders include many kind of the leading uh, figures in the early American labor movement of the early 20th century. Mother Jones, Eugene Debs, and Emma Goldman, among them. Um, and in 1914, 1915, they decide that they want to organize hobos. The rest of the unions in the United States saw hobo workers as degenerates, unorganizable, um, and counterproductive to the kind of wider aims of, of unionism. That, that these people are not the type of people you want to have in your union. Whereas the industrial workers of the world said, you know, they are the lowest rung on the kind of ladder of the working class in this country. 
They're poor, they're marginalized, they're abused by police, they make nothing, you know, the conditions are just so awful, we should organize them. And that we're gonna have, you know, thus one of the largest unions in the United States as a result. So they do, this is, this is on the left, this is actually a, a red card for a, a hobo who's a member of the Agricultural Workers Organization 400, which is the industrial workers of the world. But communities didn't like the IWW. They're anarchists. They are advocating for the overthrow of the capitalist system and, and the um, organizing of one big union that all members of the working class, regardless of trade or craft, will come together under the banner of the industrial workers of the world. So many communities really do not like when the IWW shows up. The IWW also, among its, its kind of positions, also advocates for sabotage. Um, and whether that actually happens or not, there's, there's a lot of circumstantial um, evidence that hobos would put like a feedback through a thresher when they wanted better wages. <laughs> it's kind of kind of hit or miss. So when the IWW has um, the the Agricultural Workers Organization has their annual convention in 1917 in Omaha. This is then what is is on the front page of the Omaha Bee, the I won't welcome. Um, they really don't want the IWW there. And, and nevertheless, the IWW uh, creates a state headquarters on uh, 1301 Douglas Avenue down in Jobbers Canyon, um, where they have a, a IWW hall where folks get together, they sing songs, they have lectures, they have a library, you can always get a cup of coffee and a donut, um, and then also organize to try to demand better working conditions, better pay, um, and better resources. And many communities have kind of a, a uneven alliance, or at least acceptance, of the IWW when they come through town. This is um, on the right, actually a ledger from the uh, Adams County Historical Society, um, when the IWW invades Hastings in June of 1916. Uh, it's estimated 200 Wobblies came into Hastings for, for the local harvest, um, and were passing through towns on a daily basis. Um, Exaggerated reports began appearing in the local papers that more hobo, the, the hobos outnumbered the male population in Axtell, and that another hundred hobos were coming in from both Lincoln and Blue Hill, and that there were 60 wobblies coming in from Fremont. Um, reports on Burlington trains, quote, with tramps, harvest hands, and IWWs clinging on like flies, end quote, led to locals to believe an anarchist invasion was underway in Hastings. And those can, even though there were these concerns in the press, most local farmers were like, yeah, no, we, we need workers. It's the harvest season. You know, you're kind of overblown this a little bit. We need people to, to get the crops out of the fields. 65, um, and when the, when the IWW did show up, and, and about 200 do ultimately show up in Hastings, 65 found work that first day, and another 16 sought help from the Chamber of Commerce through their employment agency. So think about that. The Chamber of Commerce in Hastings is, is providing work for, for anarchist hobos. You know, it, it, again, this shows both the need and the disdain for these folks. The, the press can talk about them cleaning like flies, and the Chamber of Commerce is like, I know we need them to work. We don't care about their politics. We need somebody to get the wheat out of the field. And in the evenings, the hobos would gather at the edge of town. So some Hastings reporters felt brave enough that they went down to the hobo meetings. <coughs> <coughs> And the hobos, when they described this, that the, the hobos took up collections for food. Somebody would go into town, get enough food to feed everybody. Um, and then they also reiterated the need. They, they continually talked to, to the members, saying, you know, we can't be getting drunk. We can't be angering the locals. We need to keep in their good graces, right? We want to improve your conditions. We want, we want the farmers to understand that you are good workers, that you do good work, and that you deserve the money that we're going to be asking for. So they, they typically are getting paid between two to three dollars a day, but the IWW is calling for a four dollar a day wage, okay, which is not a big increase, but just enough to help them survive. And only two um, wobblies ultimately were arrested in this entire invasion. Um, this is one of them. Um, and they were arrested for drunkenness, and then they were kicked out of the union. So, you, so they're also very clear in, again, wanting to keep on, on the good graces. Now these gatherings that, that are accounted for in this so-called invasion of Hastings, um, were quite common among hobos that, that after the end of the day, they would go and they would meet in the jungle, they would meet in a barn, they would meet somewhere, um, and they would share food, they would share advice, they would share tactics on, on how they were organizing, and then they would also sing. 
So the industrial workers of the world, among the many kind of contributions to, to US history at large, is their contributions to American folk music, and that's what's here on my left. This is the Little Red Songbook that the industrial workers of the world still publish. And it's a collection of kind of classic American folk songs that were developed by the union um, that, that are all set to the tune of um, other types of songs, often to uh, the opposing foe of the IWW was the Salvation Army, because they would both stand on street corners and try to evangelize different kinds of folks. So the IWW would, would uh, co-opt church hymns and other Salvation Army songs and then set them to uh, labor songs. Um, and some of these include Solidarity Forever, which, which is a classic uh, union song now, The Tramp, or The Mysteries of Hobo Life. Now, the Wobblies pass through Hastings without any problems. There's, there's just the two arrests, the two were then um, kicked out of the union. Um, and the Wobblies actually go to the city and they say, we want to have something really, really good here. We don't want to anger anybody. Um, and so the organizers meet with the, the chief of police and then the head judge. And they have such a good relationship that um, the city, actually the police station, allows the hobos to put their wages in the safe so that they're not spending it and that no one steals it from them. <laughs> so again, this is, this is the uneven kind of relationship that many of these communities have. Again, we need them, but we really don't like them. Um, and so despite this you know, relatively conflict-free um, account, of this invasion, the coverage of the IWW's action elsewhere in the state and nation continued to, to stoke tensions. And, and Lincoln, at the same time that this is going on, um, Sheriff Hires, who was already recounted in song, refused to negotiate with the Wobblies passing through town, proclaiming, quote, that hobos can't run over the city and county while I'm in office, end quote. And he arrested two um, IWW organizers who then assaulted the sheriff, um, and this ended any possibility of cooperation in Lincoln. Um, and then when, when more hobos are called into Lincoln to, to start organizing, Governor John Moorhead calls for their arrest and detention and they remain in prison, again, precluding any sort of, of organization or cooperation between the authorities and Lincoln. So you see how different communities are responding to these different folks. Now, this is right before World War I well, before the entrance of the United States into World War I, and with the rise in nativist and nationalist rhetoric during the First World War, uh, the IWW is, is particularly targeted. And so raids are held of IWW halls all across the United States, including the Omaha Hall. Um, and when they raid the IWW Hall in, in Jobbers Canyon, um, they confiscate $78,000, which is a good, good chunk of change. Um, and then two tons of periodicals. So one of the ways that the IWW got their message heard is through the Little Red Songbook, newspapers, pamphlets, other kinds of things, but two tons of paper, okay, that they were using to kind of disseminate their message. And they arrested 64 members, and this is November of 1917. None of those detainees ever had a trial. And they were imprisoned and, and ultimately released in January of 1918. So they were just arrested for, for their political affiliation, nothing more. Um, but in the process, the federal government destroyed all two tons of periodicals, which as a historian, that's two tons of archival material that then does not survive. <laughs> um, and so the Wobblies are, are significantly suppressed through the First World War and, and um, really kind of begin breaking apart in the 1920s as much of their leadership, some of their leadership is deported, um, and, and it's really not the force that it was anymore for hobo workers in the state. So you're left with this. This is, this is North Douglas Street during the Great Depression. Following the First World War, um, social workers and sociologists claimed that, that hobos were disappearing. Um, Nels Anderson, who was, who was a, a former hobo turned sociologist, claimed that hobos were, were taking other types of work and that the introduction of cheap automobiles allowed men to travel now with their families. And so they were known as rubber tramps. You don't need to ride the train anymore when you've got a used Model T. Um, you can bring the whole family. They were also known as flipper hobos or, or fly-by fords. But the hobo's disappearance, disappearance is, is, is very overstated. There's a lot of Department of Agriculture material and reports from farmers who are like, no, we still need people, not everybody is beginning to have the new types of 
agricultural mechanization that is coming into this time period. Not everybody has a, has a fancy new combine. Not everybody's got a, got a fancy tractor. Um, so the, the estimates um, in 1921 said that Dawes and Kimball County, 60% of the farm workers were hobos in 1921. In Buffalo County, it was at 50%, and Dawson County, it was 30%. So you're still seeing a significant demand for out-of-town transient work. Um, and young men still also found time being a hobo. In 1922, William Schreier, who was then just a college student at Coe College in Iowa, traveled into western Nebraska to uh, work on the trains, and, or to work in the fields. And, and every night he came together into a barn with a bunch of old wobblies, and they sang from the Little Red Songbook. Now, you might not recognize the name William Schreier, but he would then become one of Edward R. Murrow's men and he wrote The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. He was the Berlin correspondent for CBS News. Um, was also a friend of Mahatma Gandhi. But, you know, you, you, when you spend your college years working the harvests in western Nebraska, um, you know you're going to kind of live a, an adventurous life. But then that gives us the Great Depression. Now, Wall Street rumblings were far and away from, from most Nebraskans' minds in October of 1929. Um, in Plattsmouth, for example, the tribulations of a, quote, intoxicated rubber tramp who had nearly burned down a barn on October 29th was the front page story. It wasn't the uh, Wall Street collapse in Washington or in, in New York City. It was, it was a hobo who nearly burned down a barn. That was the big news the day the Great Depression started in Plattsmouth. The financial events of that day were found on page five. Again, not that important. Local attention was on the corn harvest, understandably. Farmers hoped for another good year, would, would kind of move out of the, the long depression that folks had had during the time period, but unfortunately the aftershocks continued and, and banks began to collapse and, and um, many, many, many men and women began taking to the rail. Um, in Beatrice, for example, Chief Acton reported 1,000 transients had passed through the city's jail in the winter of 1931-1932. So you're seeing untold numbers of men and women, largely men, passing through. He also checked every single one of them for an IWW card. Still residual fears about anarchists among the hobo ranks. In Omaha, the Men's Homeless Bureau served 2,776 men in 1932. Unemployment, homelessness, transients, these are all the watchwords of the Great Depression in this time period. And they were not isolated to Nebraska by any means. Lauren Isley, who some of you might remember, he's the naturalist um, from Lincoln, recalled that all over America, men were drifting like sargo, sargo, sargasso weed in a vast dead sea of ruined industry. And before Isley had attended UNL, and before he becomes the, the well-known scientist of the 50s and 60s, um, he was just another Nebraskan hopping freights all across the American West. Um, he recalls this in, in his memoir, All the Strange Hours, and he recalls, quote, how after mile after desolate mile, the Nevada desert glided by, as he lay prone on top of a boxcar with his wrist tied to the running board, so when he fell asleep, he wouldn't fall off. <laughs> but afterwards, he caught a mail train, but battled a railroad bull at 60 miles an hour on a train. Um, the bull bashed him in the face and tried to throw Isley out over the wheels, but he hung on and fought back for dear life until the train eased into Provo. He escaped with his life and blood and had a bloodied face, and his raw reaction remained even decades later when he writes about it. He says, quote, I could kill him now after all these years, end quote. Nor is this his only in violent encounter. Somewhere between Tucson and Los Angeles, um, another hobo stabbed him in the back. And so for the rest of Lauren Isley's life, he never kept his back to a door. He always kept his back to a wall. Nor is he the only one who could found this. This is Rudolph Hoblin. He's probably my favorite Nebraska hobo. Uh, he's from Eagle. Um, he's a UNL dropout. Um, and this is, this is a photo of him somewhere in Pennsylvania, but this is a letter that he writes to one of his college professors um, from a lumber camp in Quebec. And the return address at the top, and it, it, it's, it's kind of hard to see, is a question mark. <laughs> um, so he writes to, to uh, his, his um, college professor um, and says that he was, quote, now buried up here in the wilderness, end quote, of Canada. And he, he rode the rails and kept a scrapbook, which is very, very helpful, of all of his experiences and then would later write about it. But he eventually comes in 
uh, from his time and goes and visits this, this professor, Lowry Wimberly, who's the founder of Prairie Schooner, um, and gets uh, Rudolf Umland a job at the, the WPA, the Federal Writers Project, where he then spends the rest of the depression with Lauren Isley, actually. Um, almost certainly telling experiences about their hobo days. And much of this time period in Nebraska is documented by the photography of John Basham. So he was a member of the Farm um, Security Administration um, who were tasked with documenting what was going on in the Great Depression. So he spent a significant amount of time in Omaha in the 1930s, um, as well as traveling all over the United States. And so when he's actually doing this in the 1930s, um, he goes down to Lower Douglas and photographs Hobos, who are very, very angry because an Omaha World Herald reporter had been there the, the day previously to do like an expose on hobo life um, in Jobbers Canyon. Um, and so they were really not happy that there was another kind of fly on the wall figure. But these photos are just absolutely incredible. Again, documenting just kind of street life. And you know, these men who are, are out of work, they're middle aged or older, there's no unemployment insurance. Many of them have worked in the railroads, they've worked in the packing plants, you think about the industries in Omaha, and there's nothing. We have many missions. This is, this is the, the church mission that operates in the area during the time period. You see, this is, this is a, a, a blind beggar that he photographs on the street corner in downtown Omaha. And just the reality of the conditions of the folks who are, are passing through. Okay. And you can see the weight of the depression. You can see the weight of unemployment. You can see the challenges in these photos. Just, just incredible um, photographs. And it's, it's, it's hard on, on John. He writes to his wife, his correspondence survives, and he talks about how difficult it is to, to be going down there day after day and seeing these men. Now, which brings us back to Gus. We close today's time. Gus was still riding trains in the 1930s, if you believe it or not, but preferred to travel by coach. After getting off the road in 1897, he joined the Army, went to college, and found work in Chicago as a journalist, film critic, and occasional poet. He also dropped Gus for his birth name, which was Carl. In October 1937, Carl Sandberg, no longer a hobo, was one of America's most respected writers with the first of his three Pulitzer Prizes under his belt. Yet his hobo experience never was far from his mind, shaping his poetry for the remainder of his life, seen here in the 1918 poem, Prairie, which is from his collection, Corn Oscars, which is named after Nebraska. Lovely poem in that collection from an Omaha hotel room, hotel room window. And he was invited to speak at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln and Link at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. And, and Sandberg was traveling along a route that he had viewed from the open door of the Chicago Burlington Quincy boxcar many decades before. Looking out the window, as the passenger train passed through Ashland, Carl Sandberg hoped to see back 40 years. He scanned the right of way, hoping to see a campfire and circle of men deep in the brush, but the hobo jungle he had made his home in 1897 was gone. And he, he, Laments this to the students who then pick him up at the depot. They're also confused why he's in a, in a coach and not on a Pullman. He's got a field surprise. Why are you? Anyway. Sandberg and, and thousands of others descended on Nebraska by, by freight, seeking opportunity. At a critical juncture in the state's history, from the end of the Civil War through the Great Depression. Maligned, ridiculed, and misunderstood, they battled hostile bulls and indignant locals while toiling beneath the beating sun for a meal, a bed in a hayloft, and meager wages. Hobos responded to the abuses and indignities thrown at them by pushing back against abusive bulls, carving out their own spaces in rural campsites and skid rows, and organizing under the banner of the industrial workers of the world. Hobos rightly deserve a place within Nebraska's history, and have, you know, they provided the, the backbreaking of seasonal labor that transformed family farms into the industrial agricultural enterprises of today. Thank you, and if anyone has questions. Many of, they also, they also steal a train in, in Omaha, a train is stolen for them. Um, 
Many of the railroad employees are members of the Knights of Labor, which is an early labor union that is, that is supportive of the aims that are going on, and also many of these unemployed men are former railroad workers in and of themselves. Um, and so they can run steam locomotive. Um, so in this case, they, they take these trains, and the railroads know that um, they're out, and so they, they clear paths, they kind of let them, they, ta they, they tacitly let them do this. It's, it's easier to get them just to move on. It, they'll eventually recover the train um, at some point. Um, this happens again in, in, in Omaha, where once the Kelly's army gets into Omaha, uh, they're, they push him into Council Bluffs and make him an Iowa's problem. And uh, a group of young women, including, um, it, it's, it's three women, and then the son of one of the women, who's a Knights of Labor um, railroad engineer, take a passenger train that has just come into the depot, steam it back up and take it over the river and gift it to, to the army. And they say, no, it's only got three passenger cars. It's a local train. We can't fit 1,500 men on three passenger cars. So the, the railroads are, 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 the railroad workers are somewhat complicit in, in facilitating their travels. Now, um, the railroad executives, there's, there's some correspondence from, from James J. Hill of the Great Northern who, who writes about how they should be met with militia and fixed bayonets to, to stop them from moving. And uh, there are actual detectives embedded in Kelly's army who are reporting back to, of all people, Jay Sterling Morton, Secretary of Agriculture, founder of Arbor um, Nebraska City's most famous, famous son, um, talking about what's going on. So there's, there's fears that they're going to like overthrow the government, and it's going to be um, this kind of all-out disaster, and Cox just ends up getting arrested for walking on the grass. I once drove all through the old warehouse which had been torn out. What do you think they might have done with that to preserve it? Uh, if it, was still, it, it was really, really interesting and large. Mm -hmm. I mean, they would have almost certainly done what, what they've done now with the old market. Um, mixed use, a lot of uh, housing. I mean, because these are, these are enormous warehouses, the, the uh, John Deere Depot or warehouse. Because um, what Chavez Canyon is, it was a, a warehouse district for, for um, a lot of businesses and a distribution hub. So there would be like wholesalers for a wide range of different products that then would be distributed out elsewhere on the Great Plains. And so you had, you know, giant John Deere warehouse, you have, you have giant warehouses for, for other types of, there's um, a, a big coffee warehouse that's, that's still there, um, among others. So they would have probably done all sorts of redevelopment, but it had been recognized as a National Historic District. Then that, why, why were they allowed to tear it all out if it was on that list? Because uh, that doesn't actually prevent you from tearing anything down. Um, and the mayor at the time and the other business leaders kind of threatened to, to leave the city if they didn't get a new headquarters. Um, so large swaths of it. And they left anyway. And they did, they did, they, they did. Chicago. They did, and so now it's, now it's the Jean Laney Mall, the former public library, which is also demolished. Um, some of the buildings from that district do survive. Um, the Burlington, Missouri headquarters, railroad headquarters is still there. Um, and there are other kinds of structures from, from Jobbers Canyon that, that, that survived, but the rest of it was imploded in the 80s. Uh, it's, it's the 80s. It's, it's the late 80s, early 90s. Because through museum, uh, there was a family that started, that was the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of that? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. It's all the day beginning of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, this is. Well, there is there is a uh, Omaha Public Television documentary on Jobbers Canyon where they interview the mayor at the time. I think it's Hal Dobb, actually, um, and a couple of other folks um, who were involved in it. Um, and obviously, it's more timely now with the Conagra has also pulled out. Yeah. When I was a young girl, I was the my mom was a really good baker, and these men had to have her house marked somehow mm -hmm. because, like, at 8 o'clock at night, it'd really be dark, and we get this knock on the door. It was never the same guy, but my mom always made sure that us girls were nowhere around. <laughs> but, you know, she always fed them. We didn't have a whole lot, but she always shared. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of interesting debate on, on feeding what you should do. Um, in Wallace's Farmer, which is the Des Moines farm paper, there's 
series of letters to the editor in the 1930s about what you should do when the hobo's not at your door, and it's farm wives kind of responding about the different things, and there's this mother who, who from Missouri who writes and says, well, my, my son is out there, and so I'm gonna feed whoever comes to my door, because I would hope that they would do the same. This, this is really interesting. How did you get interested in to this topic? <laughs> Good question. Um, so after my time um, as an undergraduate, I worked at a homeless shelter. Worked at the, the front desk at the largest day shelter in the state of New Mexico with a little four foot tall Polish American nun. And um, <laughs> no, but, but oof, yeah, if you, you don't want to get on the wrong side of such reactions. And um, my clients would come and tell me stories. And the, the you know homeless men and women um, who and they're not part of the, the typical historical record, so that's what I set out doing my, my doctoral work on was the history of homelessness. Um, but then as I start doing that, um, I am confronted by a HIPAA and a wide range of privacy laws that will prevent me from looking at case files for homeless shelters for 75 years. Oh, wow. um, so doing any, any history of homelessness is, is incredibly difficult because of the legal restrictions and also homeless shelters don't keep records um, for long term. And so that then brought me into these folks, because there's no privacy records about hobos, and uh, they're everywhere. You give me a half hour, I'll find a hobo in an archive. Um, I'm not even kidding. Um, and so falling into this, you know, living on the Union Pacific, being from a small agricultural town, this just fit. Yeah. Different types of things, but then in the 1940s, 
many of these kid row neighborhoods because there's, there's no need for the hobos anymore. Um, agricultural labor has, has been heavily mechanized and what little um, agricultural work still needs labor is, is Coursera labor at this point. Um, many of those men are like World War II veterans and they're, they're going to the same flop houses, the same bars, um, and, and dealing with some of the same mental issues. So, so there's a lot of that. It's not always recognized as such in the historical record, so you kind of have to read between the lines. Um, but there's a lot of case files that survive for different shelters and things that some of this some of is documented, just it's, it's shell shop or it's, or it's something else. So one last question. I grew up here, this, if you want to turn the museum, it's about a mile and a half west of there, but I lived in Buffalo County for probably 45 years now. But when my dad was a little bitty boy being in the Depression, him and my grandma always referred to them as gypsies. And is that a whole different deal? So for, for some folks, it might actually be members of the Roma community who, who um, but yeah, also. Said they come and mm -hmm. my grandma would feed anybody. She'd mm -hmm. give them milk, she'd give them. My dad always said, if you give them that milk, and then they go out and steal all the eggs out of the hen house. You know, you know, and so this, and, and some of them certainly were transient workers or folks passing through. It's, it's kind of the, the mobility thing, the fact that they're moving. Maybe that they were not part of the railroad, but they were a whole different deal. And I suppose they could travel, you know, because that'd be from the, at least from the Union Pacific tracks, that'd be probably two, three, four miles where they were. You know, so I didn't know if that was one and the same or if they were a whole different. They could just be going between farms. You know, they've got, they got work and they, or they're just walking. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to comment about the gal that said her mom only sped the hobos. I remember as a kid when I must have been somewhere around probably eight or ten years old and there was a knock on the door and I went and answered the door. It was night time and there was a guy standing there that had white gloves on and he said he needed either a job or uh, food, and kind of as a kid, scared me to death. And I said, whoa, 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 wait, wait, I'll go get, get, get my dad, you know? And I think it, it was a hobo, and that was, and that would have been in the 60s, so were they still possibly around then? Yeah, because the, the, the couple of things kind of, quote, unquote, killed a hobo. Uh, the diesel locomotive, trains don't need to stop as often, and they can go a lot faster. Um, it makes it harder. Uh, farm mechanization, you just, you're just not needed. Um, and mechanization of other industries as well. Um, for Sarah labor in, in many of the agricultural industries, um, because they have a they have a new um, facet of that that the hobos don't have, and that's deportability. That they can physically be removed from the community and the nation, whereas hobos are more likely than not citizens or at least naturalized. Um, and so there are folks who do go through the, through the 50s and 60s and into the 70s. Um, Jack Kerouac writes um, in an essay called The Vanishing American Hobo that it's, it's really the GI Bill. The, the, the folks who rode the rails in the Depression, many of them were then drafted into the Second World War, and then they don't want to go back to riding the rails anymore. They want the, the support for home ownership and education that the federal government is providing. And so in the 1950s, there's a little bit of nostalgia for, for hobos and some of the literature and some of the popular culture. Um, but through the 60s and 70s, certainly, and, and even today, it occasionally makes the paper, and if you talk to some folks who work for the railroad, there's still people who ride trains. Don't call them a hobo, they're, they're rail riders. Do not call them a hobo, they'll be very mad. Um, but who are traveling for, for a variety of different reasons. Um, so it's never really stopped, it's just never been to the scale. Um, and particularly after 9-11, many of the railroads, as I'm certainly you've seen around here, they've put up a lot of fences, there's a lot more security, you, you know, cameras and different things, so it's a lot harder now. Um, and even the design of train cars, um, fewer box cars, it's container cars which are open on the bottom, um, no caboose, you know, all of these different things. But, but there are people who are, who are going through the 60s and 70s, certainly. Um, for a variety of reasons. A lot of more people are also hitchhiking because we had an interstate system and stuff like that. But. Well, and then this comment kind of goes along mm -hmm. with hers about the gypsies. Um, I'm like from Alda, six, five miles south of, of the Union, Union Pacific mm -hmm. uh, tracks down by the river. And uh, I was always told that when the gypsies came through, 
they would wash their clothes in a, a specific horse tank that the farmer always kept his uh, teams of work horses at. And once they washed the clothes, the horses would not drink from the water anymore because of the soap uh, that was in the tanks. And then they'd have to drink the tanks and refill them. And that would be down right close to the edge of the river of the pond. All right, well, um, help me in thanking Dr. Ty again for coming today and talking about